continue my series of random messages from Ephesians. And um, um, my message is, uh, you know, who's really going to heaven? And uh, let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll get into this morning's message. Gracious Father, we thank you. We praise you and we give you honor. We thank you that we have a a place in which we can still preach the Word of God. Bless the Word as it goes forth. Give each of us divine revelation and wisdom and a download from heaven as the Word goes forth, Lord. Bring revelation to your Word. Illuminate it, Lord. This is the only living book out of all the millions and millions of books there are. There's only one living book. It's your holy, precious Word. Bless us now, Lord, as we look at various passages from your Word. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're already going to do. Your, your half-brother said, if any of us lack wisdom, we're to ask of God, and wisdom will be granted abundantly and liberally. So we thank you, Lord, for doing just that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I don't know if you remember <coughs> Mickey Mantle, but for many generations, Mickey Mantle was a household name, especially if you grew up in the 50s and the 60s. Um, um, and you knew anything about baseball, everybody knew who Mickey Mantle was. Back then, um, you know, he was probably one of the most famous um, sports figures in America. And uh, if you had uh, a liking for baseball, little schoolboys by the millions imitated his swing, dreamed one day that they could make it to the big leagues like him and play baseball like the Mick. And Sports Illustrated called, called him the last great player on the last great team. But most of you know that uh, um, in 1995, Mickey Mantle died from deadly cancer. Cancer spread throughout his entire body and by his own admission, Mickey Mantle said that he abused his body through the years by hard living and hard drinking. And so he said that the demise of his body was pretty much his own fault. And in the months before he died, he liked to joke that when he gets to the gates of heaven, the Lord would say, Mickey, I can't let you in after the way you've lived. And some of us might have that same thinking. You know, because of the way you've lived, sorry, it's not going to work. But as Mickey told the story, just as he was ready to turn around and leave the pearly gates, the Lord would say, but while you're here, would you mind signing about six dozen balls for me. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty funny story when I read it. But against this whole backdrop, you know, I, I guess we could raise the question, did Mickey Mantle go to heaven? A lot of us probably wonder that about various people. Did so-and-so make it? Did so-and-so not make it? I often think to myself, if we make it to heaven personally, we're probably going to be surprised who's there and probably be surprised who's not there. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think he was um, clearly thinking about heaven um, in his last few days, especially based on the testimony that, uh, that I read. But by his own admission, he said that he didn't deserve to go. And in fact, he expected that the Lord would turn him away. But perhaps... Um, Perhaps you might have seen the, the funeral in Dallas for him. Um, Bob Costas, the, the old uh, NBC sportscaster, he got some press for his great moving eulogy that day. But former teammate Bobby Richardson gave the most important message when he packed the sanctuary of Lover's Lane Methodist Church in Dallas. How Mickey had called him and asked for prayer just two days before he died. When he went up to see him in the hospital that same day, uh, uh, he brought up the subject, um, you know, I want you to know that I've accepted Jesus Christ as, a, as my Savior, according to what uh, Bobby Richardson um, reported in his eulogy. But he wanted to make sure, so... He shared the gospel again with Mickey Mantle anyways and explained what it meant to trust God, trust Christ as your Savior. And when he finished, Mickey Mantle said, that's exactly what I already did. Yeah. And the next day, knowing that his death was near, with a smile on his face, he said, I'm ready to go now. 
let's get on with it. And within a couple of hours of making that statement, Mickey Mantle died. So did Mickey Mantle make it to heaven? To us, I guess, the question might seem a little academic, but it was a great question on his mind for those people that day in Dallas. You can read the news reports about it, because I did. But the sermon is not about um, heaven in general, or even about salvation in general. But it's about the heart of salvation. And that's really what I want to speak about this morning, the heart of salvation. Because the heart of salvation is really the forgiveness of sin. And this is a central truth in the Christian gospel, because no one can make it to heaven unless their sins are forgiven. You know, no matter what you think, unless your sins are forgiven, the gates to heaven are locked. You know, when I grew up, I grew up in a liturgical church where you recited the Apostles' Creed every single Sunday. It begins with words like, I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth. And it goes on to cover all the major Christian doctrines. At one point in time from this pulpit, I broke down the Apostles' Creed over a number of weeks to hit all the major doctrines that are covered by the Apostles' Creed. And most scholars believe that the Apostles' Creed goes back to the 2nd century after Christ, meaning that it's perhaps the earliest surviving Christian creed, a creed of, of faith. And it's not very long, only a few sentences. And it contains a number of short phrases. The second sentence goes like this, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church. Not Catholic in terms of, well the Catholics say it in terms of their own church, but Catholic means universal not Catholic in terms of a denomination, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Those are all big-time doctrines that Christians believe absolutely. But did you notice something tucked away in that last phrase is the forgiveness of sins? That strikes me as pretty important um, because... This ancient creed lists everything that early Christians considered essential to Christian faith. It's also the things that, from a biblical perspective, are considered the same. But that's one reason that I believe in the forgiveness of sins, because the earliest Christians in the Bible believed this as well. They understood that at the heart of the gospel itself is the message of forgiveness. Oftentimes, we hold on to unforgiveness in our own lives. We have a hard time. We like when people forgive us, but we have a hard time extending forgiveness to those people that have hurt us. Some people carry hurts and wounds and pains and, and difficulties their whole life because they've never learned to extend forgiveness to another. But there's a great need for forgiveness. And you might say, well, why do we need forgiveness? And it's because that we're hopelessly lost, if we really understood our position. The Bible says it this way, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned each one to his own way. And that's pretty much the way most people live. That's Isaiah 53, verse 6. This was way before Christ's birth, hundreds of years before his birth. The prophet Isaiah got it perfectly well in terms of the way humankind is and how mankind is. We all go astray. We go our own way. We do our own thing. And most of us don't even think twice about it. We've turned each one to his own way, his own sinful way. And that's our problem. Our problem is sin, and it's a problem that affects everyone. Um, there's no person that's perfect except the Lord Jesus Christ. Some denominations think that their clerical people are perfect or they lift their clerical people to a point of not having sin. That's just nonsense. Um, for example, you know, they think that the Pope is, is without sin. That's just not true. All men have sin, no matter who you are. There was only one sinless man, and he was the Lord Jesus Christ. And Romans 3.23 tells it to us this way, all have sinned, not some. Not most, not those ones over there, over here. It says, all have sinned and all come short of the glory of God. 
So there's no perfect one, so stop looking at me that way this morning. <laughs> We're all sinners. We're all sinners by nature. We all have a sin nature. We're sinners by birth and we're sinners by choice. You probably didn't realize that, but you were born with a sin nature. So you're a sinner by birth. And then you go on to choose to be a sinner in your life, committing one sin after another. So we need forgiveness because actually each of us are lost. And we're lost because we're sinners and we've strayed away from the way God would want us to be. And the more sin we commit, the more we, and the further we stray away from God. Can anyone deny that America has strayed away from God? I actually believe we're in a post-Christian uh, position in America. Um, you know, we've, we've gotten rid of God from just about everything. Um, at one point in time, the Bible itself was a textbook, not in Christian schools or parochial schools, but in the early 1900s and prior, the Holy Bible was a textbook in American public schools paid for by the government of the United States. Our founding fathers and the early Christians in this country thought that the Bible itself was such a great textbook that it was a textbook in public schools. And then they decided at some point in time to throw the Bible out of our public school system. Then they decided to throw uh, prayer out of the public school system to get rid of the Ten Commandments out of the public square. And then they wonder why life is falling apart around us. When I was a kid, there was no such thing as school shootings. And now we've thrown prayer out of schools. And once there's a school shooting, what's the first thing they want to do is have a prayer meeting. Well, we should have been praying before this happened, not after. But so it is. Um, we've got things all twisted around. I mean, there's more and more people that have fallen away from God than actually come to God, but that's just the world that we live in. But, I mean, if you have any doubts about how far America has strayed from God, I mean, that's all you have to do is watch some daytime television, you know, and um, you know, things have gotten so bad that, I mean, even the leaders in Washington think that uh, from time to time we need to do something about it. And, um, you know, William Bennett and several other, other people... Um, a long time ago, you know, they called, you know, for a voluntary curb on all the crazy stuff on, on TV, but that really never worked. But, you know, there's just crazy things. I mean, you have all these crazy t TV programs, you know, husbands who cheat on their honeymoon, teenagers who murder their parents, men who date prostitutes, women who pursue the same man, you know, mothers of jilted daughters, people who who have one night stands, gay teenagers, you know, teens who object to their mother's lovers, neighbors who can't stand each other. You know, the, the crazy stuff that they have on TV just goes on and on and on. But before we say anything, I mean, ask yourself, why is all this garbage in our face constantly? I mean, really, I mean, it's, it's funny because not only is it just on TV, it's on our, our little screens. And those little screens with all those dumb little TikTok videos become addictive from what I understand. Um, you know, people just watch endless hours of all this nonsense. And then they wonder why they have so much nonsense in their head. Well, they're programmed. I mean, that's what all this stuff is intended to do, program you. And, and they're pretty effective at it. I mean, most people, according to uh, what the experts say, have 16 to 18 hours of screen time per day, whether it's their... Um, phone screen or TV screen or computer screen, which is just crazy. And people get all kinds of um, vicarious pleasure out of watching these people paraded around for their sins in front of a national audience. And that's really what it is. A lot of these people are just sinners and they just blast it in your face. And it allows us kind of to kick out the things that probably would we would think, well, I wouldn't do that myself. And then we find ourselves in that same situation. But what do you think the major problem in America is? You know, I mean, you know, there's all kinds of fighting all the time from Washington. I mean, you know, people rally about all the things that happen. But I mean, you know, it, the major problem of America has nothing whatsoever to do with politics, even though we think it's all political. You know, the problem in America is actually a spiritual problem. 
You know, we think it's the president or the Congress or, or this one or that one. Those are problems to some degree, but our real problem is a spiritual problem. See, America's sick because we're, we as a people are sick. And, um, you know, we're truly lost sheep, like the prophet Isaiah said, you know, several thousand years ago. But having gone astray from God, we've trapped ourselves into this slime pit of moral degrada degradation. And that's really where we we're at as, as a nation. I mean, we've accepted moral degradation as just normal. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, we've trapped and, um, you know, we're trapped in it and we don't even know it. You know, a lot of people have addictions to pornography. I was listening a few weeks ago to Focus on the Family, and they said that, you know, porn used to be a male problem, but the... the, the um, the highest uh, growth uh, factors with pornography is actually the female audience. And, um, you know, it's kind of crazy, but, you know, people are trapped in things like pornography. You know, you when I was a kid, you know, my brother and I, if we wanted something bad, we had to either find my dad's bad stuff or we had to go to the store and we weren't old enough to buy it, so we had to steal it. And we did that when we were kids. <laughs> I didn't say I'm going to give you my complete confession this morning. But <laughs> you know, but that stuff was mild compared to the stuff they have today. I mean, you know, it was funny because back in the 60s when my brother and I got a hold of a, a, a bad magazine that my dad had, we assumed everybody was the same from the waist down because they only showed from the waist up as being naked. We were just dumb little kids that didn't know any better, but we figured it out. You know, on the farm down the road, how it all works. But um, you know, all farmers kind of figure that out. But you know, you know, we've trapped ourselves. We don't know it. We've lost, and we don't even realize how lost we are. We don't realize how blind we are, and we don't know why we keep failing as a nation, even though we have the same blindness. We need forgiveness, but we don't know even where to look for forgiveness. You know, and the bottom line is this. Our sins have separated us from God. That's the bottom line. Our sins separate us from God. Now we wonder why we don't have God's favor. Why we have a, this constant struggle in our lives. Because we lead sinful lives. And he is on one side and we're on the other side. And there's a great divide between us. And that's the problem that all of us have. We stand on one side and cry out, help, you know, we need a bridge across the great divide, but who's going to build that bridge for us? But God has a provision in his word for forgiveness. You know, God's answer to our need is wrapped up in a person. That person's name is Jesus, and in Acts 10, verse 43, it says, all the prophets testify about him that anyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. See, all the prophets testify about him. You know, but we don't really realize that, and even if we do recognize that, we don't really grasp it as one of the desperate needs we have. All the prophets testify about him, the Lord Jesus Christ, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. Someone may hear that and say, oh, good, I believe in Jesus, but it's not enough to believe that Jesus exists. See, some of us, we have head knowledge about Jesus. We have mental assent regarding Jesus, but we don't have a relationship with Jesus. Oh, I know Jesus. You know, I told you guys my story about I had one of my Jesus t-shirts on and I was at the, at the store, the market, I think I was at Meyer, and you know this lady who was dressed in Muslim gear. She walked up to me and she says, "Oh, I love Jesus." I says, "Is he your, is he your Lord and Savior?" "Oh no, good man, good man." I said, "Well, we're talking about a different Jesus then. You don't really know him. You know of him. You know about him. He's just a prophet to you. I mean, unless he's your Lord, there's a big difference in terms of who he is." So not all people that say they have Jesus or believe in Jesus even 
have forgiveness, you know, you might think that he's nothing more than just a good man. It's not enough to believe about Jesus. And that's where a lot of people are. They believe about Jesus. The Bible says that you must believe in Jesus in order to be saved. You can't just believe about Jesus. To be specific, you must trust in Jesus so much that if Jesus can't take you to heaven, you won't go there at all. Did you hear what I just said? I mean, if Jesus can't get you to heaven, you're not going. Have you ever heard someone says, don't put all your eggs in one basket? That's how a lot of people play this game of life. You know, I, I love what Jan used to say. You know, Jan said several times um, in this church, she said, you know, people live with one foot on the world side and one foot on God's side and there's a fence down the middle, but the devil owns the fence. And we think, you know, we can, you know, play with that fence. Well, you know, the devil owns the fence. And, um, you know, don't put your all, all your eggs in one basket. That might be good advice when it comes to investing your money or other things, but it's terrible advice for investing your soul. See, that's the, that's the kind of advice, you know, people want. I'm not going to put all my eggs in one basket. I still want to play around, you know. I want to do this and I want to do that. I want to get lucky on the weekends and then come to church and, you know, try to think I'm forgiven or whatever your issue is. I mean, you know, think about it. It's okay to put all your eggs in one basket if your basket's labeled Jesus. You know, there a number of years ago, Josh McDowell, he debated, debated a well-known Muslim in South Africa he, Josh McDowell's a, a great apologist for the faith, the Christian faith. And at one point, the Muslim tried to ridicule the Christian faith by saying that Christians are riding on the back of a crucified man. Josh answered back by saying, you're absolutely right. We're riding on the back of a crucified man, and he's going to take us all the way to heaven. You need to ride on the back of a crucified man. In fact, 1 John 1, 7 says, The blood of Jesus, God's Son, cleanses us from every sin. Not some sin, every sin. See, Jesus is the way to heaven. Jesus is the only way to heaven. His blood is the price of admission to heaven. When he died on the cross, he cried out, It is finished, which literally means paid in full. Paid in full for each of us, personally, individually. You know, during one of his sermons, Billy Graham told the following story. He said there was a patrolman on night duty in the town of, in northern Britain. As he walked the streets, he heard a quivering sob. Shining his flashlight into the darkness, he saw this little boy in the shadow sitting on the doorstep with tears running down his cheeks. The child said, I'm lost, please take me home. And as the patrolman began naming street after street, trying to help the little boy remember where he lived, he named the shops and the hotels in the area, but the little boy could give him no clues in terms of where he lived. Then he remembered that at the center of the town, there was a church with a large white cross, and the cross towered high above the rest of the city. The patrolman pointed to that cross and says, do you live anywhere near that place? And the little boy's face immediately brightened up. He said, yes, sir. Take me to the cross and I'll find my way home. So you see, the cross is God's provision for one man's sin. If you go to the cross, you'll find your way home to Almighty God. See, many people are lost and confused and the cross of Christ, it beckons you to come you have to repent of your sin, and then you will receive Christ. This week I was thinking about these four important words for forgiveness in the Bible. Three are Hebrew words, and one's a Greek word. The first word is kipper, which means to cover. It's like using a rug to cover the dirt on your floor. I always wondered why my grandmother had rugs on the floor. Maybe that's it. You know, people used rugs to cover the dirt on the floor. And if you're old enough or real old and you had an old farmhouse, 
the floor was dirt. And so literally, the rug covered the dirt on the floor. Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement, comes from that word. The second word is nasa, which means to lift and take away, as when you remove a stain from a carpet. And the third word is selah, which means to pardon or to wipe away or to clean a record clean. And the principal Greek word is ephesus, which means to let go or to send away, as when you release a prisoner from jail. When you put all these words together, you get a graphic picture of what forgiveness truly is. God covers our sins. God removes the inner stain of our sin. God wipes away our personal (coughs) record clean of all of our sins. And then God releases us from the guilt so that we're set free from our sin. The Bible uses a number of word pictures to help us grasp the total concept of forgiveness. In Psalm 32, 1, it says, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. In Psalm 103, 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he, God, removed our transgressions from us. And then there's one of the most beautiful promises of forgiveness. It comes in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. It says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. How amazing is a God that can do that? He'll remember your transgressions, your sins, all your failings no more. It's kind of crazy when you really think about it. I remember a a friend of mine who told the story of a forgotten police officer that he met in a church in California. He said his friend was a cop's cop. He was tough with the capital T. And he had seen the underside of life. And, you know, he he had jaded himself with great skepticism because as a cop's cop, he's seen things that a lot of people had never seen before. And not only was he a cop's cop, he also served in Vietnam and seen many horrible things about humanity there as well. And I think that probably made him live on the edge, according to my friend. But he lived across the street from a church and his children occasionally came to Sunday school. He and Carol, his wife, would sometimes show up for services. But over the months, he said that, you know, this guy's, stories just seem beyond even plausible, incredible stories, stories that you couldn't even tell. And one day, you know, they they went to uh, share a meal at a, a Mexican place, and he says, let me tell you what happened to me. And he proceeded to tell how he had recently given his heart and his whole life, entire life, to Jesus Christ. He said something like this, as I was reading the Bible, suddenly it all hit me. This stuff is really true. Then he said how Christ had come to be his Lord and Savior. And then he said this, a description that my friend said he'd never forget. He felt as if a thousand pounds had been lifted off his shoulders after he accepted Christ. And that's what it really means to have peace with God. You know, a thousand pounds was lifted off of this jaded, skeptical police officer who had been to Nam and had been a police officer, seen many unspeakable things. But how do you have the weight of sin lifted off your own shoulders? You must be forgiven. But there's a cost to forgiveness. To speak of the cost of forgiveness may sound strange, but it comes with a price. To those who understand the doctrine of the grace of God, does the Bible not speak of salvation as a free gift? It is. Indeed it does. Because in Ephesians, the book that we're studying, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For it is by grace that you have been saved, through faith, and not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. See, no one can boast of forgiveness because it's a free gift from God. In fact, the text clearly says and clearly states that salvation comes to us as a gift precisely so that we can't boast that we did anything of ourselves to earn it. See, some people think 
Well, if I put an extra few bucks in the offering plate or if I say a few extra prayers or if I go to confession and they make me say a few Hail Marys and a few Our Fathers, you know, <laughs> I'm good. That's the way it was when I was a kid. You had to go to confession. You know, well, <laughs> that's really not a biblical place to be. Although it does say in the Bible that we should confess our sins one to another that we would be saved. But the, the, the object of confession is to bring your sins to Jesus so that you can be forgiven. You don't need a mediator like some denominations have a mediator as a priest or whatever. You need to bring your sins to Jesus and you'll find forgiveness in him. You know, it's the blood of Jesus that provides the ground for our forgiveness. Jesus really did pay it all. He didn't pay part of it. He paid it all. You don't have to add anything to it. You know, but how can there be any cost to us? Is forgiveness free or is it not free? The answer is it depends on how you look at it. From God's side, salvation is provided for you. And for me, it's free of charge because Jesus paid the complete price at the cross. We couldn't pay enough to atone for even one of our sins. How many animals were killed for the atonement of sins in the Old Testament system? Millions and millions and millions. Gallons and gallons of blood were shed. And then came the perfect Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. As one little chorus puts it, He paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. That someone is Jesus. He's the only one that can take away our sins. But from our side, actually the picture is a lot different. What will it cost you to have your sins forgiven? John Gerstner, the Presbyterian theologian, said that the only thing standing between the sinner and God is the sinner's virtue. The sinner always thinks he's better than he really is, and that's that he's not as bad as he really is. He's got it wrong on both sides, both ways. In God's eyes, the sinner is, is not so hot after all, and even his presumed righteousness is just as filthy rags in God's eyes. We see that in Isaiah 64, 6, that our righteousness is like filthy rags. What the Bible's referring to as filthy rags are actual minstrel, dirty minstrel rags, gross and disgusting. That's where each of us start from. That's why many people will never be saved. They think they're a little bit better than they really are. See, there's a lot of people like that. Well, I'm not as bad as everybody else, so I'll just leave it there and, you know, I'm going to just roll with the dice and not put all my eggs in that God basket. That's too much. You know, so they play the game and think that they're going to make it. And because they don't give up that false notion of their own goodness, they can never be forgiven. See, some of us think we're just good enough to make it. Gooder and better, not good English, but than most people. But that's where a lot of people think they are. You know, I'm gooder than the other ten people that I hang out with, so I'm the best of the bunch. I'm good. No, you're not. You only think you are. And if you think that, you're just lost and you're going to hell. So when you get there, don't say the preacher didn't tell you. Because he just did. The story is told of a very good man who one day died and he appeared at the pearly gates. He lived such a good life that he presumed that the gates would just automatically swing open for him when he got there. And he would soon be relaxing in his heavenly mansion, all was good. When he rang the buzzer at the, at the gates, St. Peter came to meet him. When the man said he wanted to enter heaven, St. Peter said, very well, you need a thousand points. You need actually a thousand points to enter heaven. The man smiled, knowing that his good works would certainly surpass that total of a thousand points. He said, during my life, I volunteered for the Red Cross. I did 
work at my community church, and I gave to every charitable organization in my town. Excellent, said St. Peter. You get one point. He needs a thousand. Somewhat taken aback, the man continued, I was a faithful family man. I, I was faithfully married to the same woman for 40 years. I loved my four children who went to the finest parochial schools. I paid for their schooling because I wanted, wanted them educated in the ways of God. Oh my, said St. Peter. We don't get too many people up there, up here like you. You actually paid for their Christian education? And you've been a faithful married man? You get another point? Now he's got two. So the guy knows he needs a thousand points. Now he's sweating profusely. And the man said, I have a few other things to tell you, St. Peter. I was a scout leader. We never missed one Sunday of church. I brought my children to church, my wife to church, every single Sunday. Never missed. <coughs> Further, I was even on the board at the church. I even sang in the choir at the church. And in my younger years, I taught Sunday school. St. Peter says, commendable in every way. What a credit that you were to the community. You did all of that, you get another point. So now you have three points. The guy falls on his knees and cried out in desperation. But for the grace of God, no one can get in there. To which St. Peter replied, you have just received a thousand points. <clears throat> See, to be saved, you have to realize first that you can't save yourself. See, most of us in our American thinking, North American thinking, we think that it's going to be based on our own merits, on our own good deeds, and all the things that we could do in our own self-righteousness. But as long as you hold on to your self-righteousness, you can't be forgiven. You'll never be forgiven. As one of the old hymns in church put it this way, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. See, a lot of times we think we have something in our hand to give to Jesus. We don't. That image of an empty hand is appropriate because it pictures exactly how we must come to Christ. Empty-handed. We come with empty hands, but we can't come to him at all. With that, we return to the original question. Did Mick, Mickey Mantle make it into heaven? He had everything. He had fame. He had fortune. Everything was on his side. But at the end of his life, his hands were empty. All those home runs and all those amazing catches, even the wonderful Oklahoma smile, couldn't forgive even one of his sins. And by his own admission... He came to the end of his life with so many sins that needed forgiveness. <clears throat> Bobby Richardson and his wife went back to visit Mickey Mantle again the day before he died. Mrs. Richardson asked Mickey a very pointed question. If you were to stand before God and he would say to you, why should I let you into heaven? He immediately replied with John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but will have everlasting life. You see, that's the right answer. Did Mickey Mantle make it into heaven? I believe he did, based on what I've read. He reached out with empty hands of faith, and he took hold of Jesus Christ completely, thoroughly, the blood of Jesus cleansed him of all of his sins and all of his crazy living. Do you remember the story that I just told you about the man who needed a thousand points to get into heaven? It's a good story, but it's partly untrue. Once you die, it's too late to receive forgiveness. See, once you die, it's way too late. No one will ever get a second chance. It's not like playing one of those games at the fairway at the carnival. Just, you know, pay half price and I'll give you another chance. Another chance to play the game of life. It doesn't work that way. 
in God's theology and in God's ways, none of us will get a second chance at the gates of heaven. You have one chance, one chance in this life to accept God and to live for him. Mickey Mantle almost waited too late. So let me ask you a very personal question this morning. Have you ever come to Jesus and had your sins completely forgiven? Has there ever been a definite moment when you repented of your sins and asked Jesus Christ to be your personal Savior? You know, this morning, once again, many of you probably are standing at the crossroads. You have another chance and another opportunity for Jesus. Or you can just continue to think, well, I think I'm good enough. I'm gooder than the rest, so I think I'm okay. If this were a Billy Graham crusade, I guess I could ask you all to come forward and stand at the front while we're singing, just as I am. But I'm not going to do that. Actually, you know, all of us need to understand personally and individually, you know, if we, if we really stand in the correct position before Almighty God. So I'll just lead us in a prayer of commitment to Christ right now. And if this is a prayer that you, can, <clears throat> that you confess with your heart, pray it along with me. It's real simple. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I, know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Here and now, Here and now I repent of my sin. I, of my sin. I trust you. As my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Make me a new person, I pray. Make me a new person, I pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. It's as simple as that. A lot of times we say words, but we don't mean them. How many times do you speak things and you don't really mean it? Way too often. We say things, we just say things to say things. We want to go along to get along. We don't really say things because we mean it. But the Bible says that not only do we confess with our lips, but we have to believe in our hearts. See, you have to have a relationship with this Jesus. It's not just enough to just profess it with your lips. You know, it's kind of crazy because, you know, if you sincerely prayed and sincerely believed that prayer the invitation to have Jesus Christ into your heart, you know, was it real? Are you real? I mean, do you really believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Yes. See, you might say it publicly and openly, you know, but what you're really saying is today, Lord, I want you in my heart. I want you to know that He's forgiven my sins because you truly are in my heart. I want peace and I want joy. See, a lot of times we don't have peace and we don't have joy because we don't have Jesus. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the giver of joy. So if you don't live in peace and you don't live in joy, He's probably not living in your heart. So you better know where you stand. You know, you have to decide. The road I'm walking doesn't take me to the place I want to end up. I want to walk on a new road. You know, the prophet Ezekiel said he wants to take that heart you have, that heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh and put a new spirit in you. That's what the living God can do. He will put a new spirit in you. His spirit, the Holy Spirit. You have to decide with his assistance that you're, you're going to take a different road, a different path. You're going to travel a different way. You have to know that you want Christ in your heart. Not just mental assent to Christ. Not just the idea of, I know a lot about Christ. You know, there's people that have come to church for 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years. They know a whole lot about Christ, but they don't know Christ. That's just the way it is. They can sit in church and think, you know, but, you know, just because, uh, just because your car's in the garage doesn't make it a car. I mean, doesn't make you a car, whatever. 
you know, just because you sit someplace doesn't make it so. You got to realize you're either in Christ or not in Christ. Giving your heart to Christ is really what it means to be a Christian. You've come to Christ. You've come by faith to the cross. And he's the one that will come into your heart and forgive you of your sins. He will change your life. If you're carrying around a burden that's more than you can handle, you probably are not there yet. You haven't asked and received forgiveness if you have guilt and shame and all the other things because what Christ does is he cleanses us from our sins and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So that cleansing power makes us into new creations. That's exactly what the scriptures tell us. We're new creations in Christ. So if you feel like a new creation, and it might take some time. I'm not saying it's instant. And just because you vocalize the words doesn't mean it's so. You have to actually believe it in your heart. And then as you believe it in your heart, the Holy Spirit will help you change. And you'll start to see godly fruit as a result of your living. If you have no godly fruit, you probably don't have a godly root. And if there's no godly fruit, you'll see what the godly fruit is in, in Galatians. But if you don't have godly fruit in your life, you probably don't have godly roots in your life. And if you don't have godly roots in your life, you probably don't have Jesus. You know, Jesus says you'll be known by your fruit. If the only fruit that your life produces is bad fruit, evil fruit, lies, deception, sexual sin, all the things that God doesn't uh, bless, well, you probably don't have enough Jesus yet. And I'm not saying it's incremental, but as we push into Christ, we become more godly. As we fill our minds with good and godly things, we have less room for evil things and sinful things. You know, the Apostle Paul said in, in Corinthians that we're to take captive every thought. See, we have to take captive to every thought. You're not responsible for the thoughts that bounce through your head, but you're responsible to take captive of the ones that don't belong there. And the more good things we put into our brains, it's like the computer thing, giggo, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, right. But the same thing applies to the things of God, good things in, good things out. And the more good things we put into our minds, the more good things we put into our lives, you know, most people are so spiritually anemic, they've never put enough good spiritual things in their life to let any spiritual roots take root. They haven't cultivated. They haven't pulled out the weeds. They let the weeds grow and, you know, maybe um, those dust balls that float around in the desert too. You know, those big uh, tumbleweeds. You let all that nonsense grow around in your head and then you wonder, what the heck is wrong with me? I'll tell you what the heck is wrong with you. You don't have godly roots. If you don't have godly fruit, you don't have godly roots. And if all that you have is the same crap over and over again, that means you better check the root. I can't pound on that drum loud and strong enough, but you get the point. I'll leave it there. But all of this is what it means to be a Christian. You know, you come by faith. But as many received him, you know, he gives you the power to become the sons of God. It's not a do-it-yourself project. See, as the Spirit of God comes in you, as we receive Him, to them He gives the power to become sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. The things that I preach are so simple, but I never said they're easy. It's simple. Even a child can understand what faith is. It's not that complicated. We make it complicated or we live on that little island. Someday I'll. Someday I'll get right with God. Someday I'll start reading my Bible. Someday I'll start praying. Someday I'll start going to church. 
Someday I'll get it right with God. Someday I'm going to start living that holy life, but I still got wild oats I want to play. So we keep buying Quaker oats. They're not bad. But when you try to sow them, they're not good either. I like oats. My late wife told me how to cook oats because I asked her one day, how, do, how come our oats are always so creamy and good? She says, you cook the hell out of them. Oh, <laughs> that lady never said a bad word, ever. <laughs> and I was surprised. See, you guys want to sow your wild oats. You want good oats that bless you, cook the hell out of them. I can't be any more clear than that. And some of you, if you don't want to get cooked later, you better get the hell out of you, too, before it's too late. And you can only do that by coming genuinely, sincerely, and absolutely to Christ. Ask God daily, Lord, let these roots of righteousness, let these roots of godliness take hold in me. You know, you can't play with the devil and then expect to have godly roots and godly fruits. It doesn't work that way. If you want the fruit of the Holy Spirit, you better tend and find out what those fruits are. You can look them up. Galatians chapter 5. The first fruit is love. And if you don't operate in that, you're not going to get the rest of them. And so there it is. It's very simple. It's not that complicated. If anybody needs prayer, the altars will be open. But you know what? I don't want any of you to have the excuse where I didn't hear the message correctly or completely, didn't understand the message. It's, it's so simple. It's your job to decide whether you want to live for Jesus or not. You're just going to push them off to the side and do your own thing? You might not have time. You might not have another day. No man knows the day or the hour. The Bible tells us one thing, and I'll end with this. Today is the day of salvation. Not someday. <clears throat> Get off that little island that you're playing on. Someday aisle. You'll never, ever, ever see the kingdom of God living on that little island. And sin is fun for a season. I understand that. But it also leads to death. Spiritual death, physical death. And it's going to lead to eternal death if you're not careful. And if you don't want to be in that place, then you better think about where you stand with Jesus Christ and make some adjustments, make some changes. And even if you think you're goody two-shoes, we can all improve. The biggest room in the world is a room for improvement. And the biggest place in the world, it's not heaven, it's hell. The Bible tells us actually that hell is expanding. Why is that? Because most people are going there never says heaven's expanding. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, it says, wide is the way, narrow is the path, few enter in. If few enter in, that means most don't. So get off your little uh, high horse and you know, get off your denominationalism. You know, there's no church that can save you. There's no church that will save you. There's no pastor that will save you. Matter of fact, I'm irritated by pastors that say, oh, we got so many salvations under our ministry. If God doesn't save you, you're not saved. Amen. Only Jesus Christ can save you. He's the way, he's the truth, and he's the life. He didn't say he's a way. He said he's the way. There's only one way. And it says, no man, John 14, 6, no man comes to the Father except through me. So if it isn't through Christ, you know, there's so much sad news going on. There were some headlines this week. There's a church that I had attended um, off and on for some time, went to a lot of special events. It was called Detroit World Outreach. It was a church for decades and decades um, on Telegraph in Redford. Huge church. They have about 4,500 seats, one of the biggest churches in the area. This week it changed hands and now it's a Muslim mosque. You know, it's sad because Christians do nothing. 
you know, they, the, the people that operated the church, not the previous ones, but the present ones, they got behind on their mortgage and, um, you know, the bank put the church up for sale and bankruptcy and it was sold. And, you know, the headlines are, this is going to be the biggest Muslim mosque in America, right here in Redford, Michigan, as if the big mosque on Michigan Avenue isn't big enough. A 4,500-seat mosque. You know, God's not glorified in any of that. Uh, Islam is a false religion with a false God. There's only one God. His name is Jesus. It's so sad what's going on in this world. And us, us, us Christians are just mostly, largely, I'm not saying all of us, sitting on our hands just watching our Christian heritage go bye-bye. We're a post-Christian America. You know, we put Christ out of everything and then we wonder why things are so bad. It's obvious. But there's hope. There's always hope. Let us pray. Gracious Father, I thank you. I thank you for this word. I thank you for the blessing of this word. Father, let this word not soon depart from our minds or hearts, but let us contemplate these words. And Father, let us contemplate the fact that we need godly roots in our lives to have godly fruits in our lives. Let us stop playing church and stop playing God and stop believing that we know Jesus. Instead, let us get into a relationship with Jesus where he's our Lord and Savior. He's our Master and King. We have far more to gain than we have to lose. And Father, by knowing you, we have everything that we need for life and godliness. Just as the Apostle Peter said in the Word, in Jesus' name I pray, bless us, Lord. Bless us. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.